When you are ready to begin the presentation. Okay, it's okay, we're doing it. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Okay, hello, can you um, hear me, Nikki? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Well, hello um, to everyone who's joined us today. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to the first in the CREMS webinar series. So CREMS is um, the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use and we're very pleased um, to introduce our webinar series and the first in that series today. Um, and if you'd like to find out more about the series, you can visit our website comorbidity.edu.au training to hear about um, the schedule of webinars that we have um, over the day, over the year, sorry, over 2015. And also um, subscribe to our mailing list to receive updates about those. But my name is Lexine Stepinski and I'm a research fellow within CREMS and I'll just start by telling you a little bit about our organisation. So this is our um, team at CREMS, so the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use, which is directed by Professor Marie Thiessen, and you can see there one of our youngest members, little Harry to the right. And what CREMS is all about is conducting research to significantly improve the understanding of mental health disorders and substance use, and particularly when those problems co-occur, as they frequently do, and also looking to improve prevention and treatment approaches for those disorders. And so this um, webinar series is really all about communicating those latest research findings. So we're very pleased to have you um, for our first in this series and the title of the talk today is Drug and Alcohol Use Among Young People, What Can Parents and Schools Do to Prevent the Harms? And our main presenter today, we're really happy to have Dr Nikki Newton. Um, and Dr Nikki Newton is a Senior Research Fellow and she's Director of the Prevention Stream of Research at CREMS and she leads a program of research aimed at developing and evaluating innovative approaches to the prevention of alcohol and drug use in adolescence. So welcome Nikki and thank you for being with us today. Thanks Lexine. Um, but so before I pass over to Nikki, um, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background and first acknowledge the, the team of, of people that's contributed to this work um, and in addition our funders, um, NHMRC and the Australian Government Department of Health. And where we're, um, to give you an idea where we're going with the talk, first of all I'll give you a little bit of background about who gets into trouble with drugs and alcohol and in particular why does it matter, why is it important to, to look at these issues um, with teenagers. I'll then pass over to Dr Newton and she'll talk about um, whether we can prevent these problems, um, how we might go about doing that and then finally I'll tell you about um, some work that I've been helping um, Nikki with over the past few years on the Positive Choices um, project, which is all about um, improving access for schools and parents to resources. But to start with, just a little bit of background about alcohol and drug use in Australia. So we know that 80% of Australians um, aged 14 and over drink alcohol. And we also know, concerningly, that more than one in three Australian young people have consumed alcohol at a level that puts themselves at risk of serious harm or injury. And 26 have done this monthly. 35% um, have tried cannabis. Um, and 11% have tried ecstasy. And then we have a small percentage that have also tried um, some of the new um, synthetics, so uh, so-called legal highs and emerging other emerging substances. And now at this point, we just like to take a bit of a poll from the audience. Um, so what we want to know is who do you think is most likely to have an alcohol use disorder out of, out of these groups? So you should have a poll popping up on your screen now. Who do you think is most likely to have an alcohol use disorder? Middle-aged man, female or a young male? 
And just while you're putting in your answers, just to mention that we'd love to hear your questions. Please just submit questions via um, the software um, panel and then we'll be taking some questions at the end. Okay, I think most people have voted now. And so, okay, and so we've got a very clever audience because 45% correctly um, guessed a young male. So, contrary, there's sort of a perception, the stereotype is that people with alcohol use disorders or substance use disorders is that perception of an, an older male alcoholic. But in fact, young males aged 18 to 24 are the most likely group to have um, an alcohol use disorder. And overall, males are twice as likely to experience these problems. But I do note though that this is starting to change. So what we see over time is that the gap that historically has been seen between men and women where males um, were much more likely to have these problems is really shrinking and that's quite a dramatic um, change. Um, and Do Dr. Kath Chapman has done some work in this area. So I'd encourage you if you're interested to tune into our next webinar where she'll talk a little bit more about the gender gap and how that might be changing over time and why that might be. But there is also some, um, some good news on the horizon. So what we're seeing um, when we look at the differences between 2010 and two th compared to 2013, we're seeing that more 12 to 17 year olds are abstaining um, from alcohol. Also daily smoking um, declined significantly during that time. So from 15% to around 13%, um, 12.8% there. And it's impressive when you look um, since 1991, the daily smoking rates have, have almost halved. So very encouraging there. And furthermore, younger people are delaying the uptake of smoking. So that's inclined to happen at a later age now compared to say 1995. So this is encouraging and there's been a lot of um, public health campaigns and ed education which may be um, responsible um, for some of this, but there's certainly more work to be done. So why is it so important to invest resources into the prevention of drug and alcohol problems? Well, I'll just talk about a few um, reasons. Firstly, we know that the onset of drug and alcohol use is in the teen teenage years. This is when they're starting to try these substances out. So it's important um, to, to put interventions at this, in, this critical stage. And secondly, the um, harms, the peak impact is within this 15 to 24 um, age group where alcohol and drug use contribute to the top three causes of death. So we can achieve a lot um, by, by preventing problems in this group. And finally, we also know from research that the earlier teenagers initiate drug and alcohol use, the greater the risk of long-term problems spanning into adulthood. So problems such as dependence on substances, delinquency and crime, other mental health problems, and also poorer um, education outcomes. Now, the developing of the effect of substances on the developing brain is another really important um, reason to target this group. We know that during adolescence, the brain is continuing to mature. It's a critical period of growth and maturation. And alcohol and cannabis can impact the brain and functions um, both in the immediate um, short term, so um, impacting on memory and learning, capacity of students to, to learn in school. But also we know now that um, these substances have an impact on how the way that the brain develops and this can result in a longer term in impact that keeps the person um, maybe stuck in a cycle of substance use. And we'd recommend if you're interested in this or if you're interested in um, speaking to your students about this, we'd recommend the Turning Point video series um, under construction, which has some fabulous videos that um, take really complex issues around brain development and the effect of alcohol and cannabis, but present them in a really creative, um, simple, fun kind of way, which is good for students, for parents. Um, so we'd encourage you to take a look at those if you're interested in knowing more. 
Okay, so finally, just having a, a quick look at the risk factors for teenage drinking. Well, there's there's many that have been identified by research, but I just thought I'd mention a recent study by Richard Mattick and colleagues at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, which in, examined a range of different individual, family and peer factors um, on teenage drinking. And what this study found, interestingly, was that Parental factors such as rules setting around alcohol, um, monitoring of teenagers and consistent rule enforcement were protective factors, so they protected against teenage drinking. And when this study examined all the factors together, they found that the most important um, risk factors for teenage drinking were whether the person's peers used alcohol, also, the perception of alcohol use is normative, so feeling like everyone is, is doing it, and that's something we'll talk more about later. Behavioural problems, and the most important factor that came out was parental supply of alcohol. So this included um, parents providing teenagers with alcohol for parties or also um, allowing them to have sips um, of alcohol, etc. So there's still some work to do disentangling um, which of those is, is um, related to risk for teenage drinking and we'd encourage you to take a look at the work um, on the link below if you're interested in that. But so um, what I'll do now is pass over um, to Nikki who's going to talk to us more about the ways that we might be able to prevent um, these problems. So just bear with us while we pass across. Okay, Nikki, um, you're on, I think. Okay, thanks, Lexine. All right, so Lexine's just set a really nice scene for us um, around who gets in trouble with drugs and alcohol and why is prevention so important. So now I'm just going to try and um, talk you through different ways that we can prevent these problems. Oh, sorry. Okay, so there's generally considered to be three types of prevention and you can see these on that graph on the slide. They range from universal prevention, which are programs delivered to entire populations regardless of their level of risk for drug use. The second is selective programs, which are targeted to groups that are at greatest risk of developing problems um, due to underlying vulnerabilities such as personality factors. And the third are indicator programs, and these are programs targeted to those already experiencing early onset of a disorder. Um, more recently though, they've been termed um, early intervention, so they're falling more in that category. Today we're going to focus on universal prevention, mainly due to the advantages that universal programs have in that they are very uh, easy to implement to, and scalable um, at the same time being cost effective. So regardless of the type of prevention, we know it's important that it has to occur early and school is the ideal location for this. School, it's not only practical, it's where students spend over 25% of their waking lives and it's when they first start to experiment with alcohol and other drugs. We're also able to tailor messages at different developmental levels and ensure that we educate prior to harmful exposure. So over the past few decades, we've seen a huge increase in the number of um, drug prevention studies, meta-analyses and reviews that have been conducted and what we now have is a set of effective principles of school-based drug prevention. What we know is that those programs found to be most effective are those with a clear evidence base and are theory driven, those that are developmentally appropriate and immediately relevant to students. That is, we know that students are really only interested in how something is going to affect them today or tomorrow, but not what's going to affect them in 20 years. We know we have to uh, implement programs early prior to harmful patterns of use, and we know that programs are most effective when they're part of a comprehensive health education curriculum. And this is really um, an advantage we have in Australia because drug education is mandatory under our health education curriculum. We also know that using peer leaders uh, can really increase the effects of a program, but it's also important to keep teachers as the central role in delivering these programs. And more recently, we're seeing an increase in interactive um, teaching approaches, and this is coming through to the drug prevention industry. And we know that these are more effective than the traditional didactic or lecture style um, approaches that you may have seen in the past. And finally, but most critical, 
is that those programs that have been found to be effective are those that adopt a social influence or a comprehensive approach to prevention. And what I mean by that is um, it, it's those programs that it, we teach kids to flip the numbers. There's three parts of the social influence approach. The first is providing kids with information and the facts about the drugs and the harms. The second is providing them with some resistance skills training. And the third is incorporating this idea of normative education and challenging the view that everyone is doing it. So when you ask a group of kids how many of their friends are drinking alcohol or how many have tried drugs, um, you'll find an overwhelming majority will say that they have, when in fact we know that the numbers are showing that they're not. So this is just an example of one of our kind of infographics that we use in our programs, saying that only one in 50 students aged 12 to 17 have tried ecstasy in the last year. So what we're trying to impart is that by avoiding drugs, the students are actually in the majority, not in the minority. And we know that this message then has really clear impacts on their behaviour and what they choose to do. So as I mentioned, as well as the, um, the reviews and meta-analyses out there around effective principles, we know that there's a number of evidence-based effective programs that do exist. And some of these you may have heard of are the Life Skills Training Program, um, the SHARP program developed in Australia, and most recently the Get Ready program, which was a huge program developed in Victoria. But despite these programs existing, we're still seeing that the dissemination of evidence-based programs into schools is relatively low. In fact, one study found that only 14% of schools choose to use programs that have been developed with the correct content and delivery to be effective. And this is largely due to the barriers and obstacles that arise when implementing programs into the school environment. Some of these include insufficient resources in terms of material, time and money for schools to implement these programs, teachers adapting programs to the school environment and thereby the programs losing their critical or active ingredients, a lack of training for teachers to implement programs, uh, schools choosing to use programs that look good or are commercially um, packaged well rather than those with the best effects and finally sustainability. So once a school chooses to use a program, how do we ensure that they keep it in there and it's easy enough for them to fit in with their, their um, curriculum. So the problem with this is that poor implementation or low implementation fidelity leads to poor outcomes. So clearly a new prevention approach was needed. One that first adhered to the evidence base, that was adhered to those effective principles of drug prevention we spoke about, and two, one that overcame the barriers to implementation um, in order to increase the implementation fidelity with an overall aim of increasing our prevention outcomes. And so this is how the climate schools model was developed. So some of you may have heard of it, but if you haven't, the Climate Schools programs are universal prevention programs which aim to prevent substance use and related harms in adolescents. They adopt a social influence approach to prevention, a harm minimization goal rather than a traditional abstinence-based goal. They're internet-based, thereby guaranteeing complete and consistent delivery. They're easy to implement with no teacher training required and they're easily embedded within the school health curriculum. They're age and context appropriate and we use interactive um, and exciting cartoons and storylines like those cartoon characters you see on the right to engage and maintain student interest. And importantly, we offer booster sessions or reinforcement through different modules over the school years which schools can or cannot choose to incorporate depending on um, their schedule. So to date, we have developed three climate schools modules for Australian high school students. The first was the alcohol module developed by Dr. Laura Vogel and Marie Thiessen at NDARC back in, I think, 2003. Um, this is for year eight students who are 13 to 14 years old. Following this, we developed the alcohol and cannabis module, which is what I did for my PhD a few, too many years ago now with Marie Thiessen uh, and these this is for year eight and nine students and it's to act as a booster to that alcohol module and transfer the skills to illicit drugs. And most recently we've developed the cannabis and psychostimulant module for year nine and ten year olds. 
each of these programs has been developed with an extensive um, process with focus groups and interviews with teachers, students and health professionals. So our aim was to develop a program by the user group for the user group so that when we came to implementing it in schools, we, we knew that it was going to be, the uptake was going to actually happen. So each program has six lessons. The first part is a 15 minute online component completed individually by the student and the second is 25 minutes of class activities. And these lessons cover areas such as alcohol guidelines and laws around alcohol and other drugs, normative use, short and long term risks and tips on staying safe and first aid. So just to give you an idea of what the programs look like, um, we get teachers and students to go to the Climate Schools website, which is climateschools.com.au. Here they're able to register their school and register as a teacher and a student and log in to the online portal. So this is what a, a student sees once they log in and here they're looking at the alcohol lesson one. So the first part, as I mentioned, is going through the cartoon storyline. So for each lesson there's about 120 cartoons, slides that you'll see and I'm just going to show you um, a little group of them now and I'll let you read through them yourself so you can understand how we impart this information to the students. So Michael's gone and done his thing and the day after he turns up at Claire's house, who isn't too impressed. Uh, yuck. <laughs> I, imagine, so see the, I imagine that's a sorry. pretty hideous thing to have um, happen if you're a 13-year-old boy vomit on a hot girl's lap, Nikki. Exactly, exactly. And we find that it, initially we found it hard to um, connect with the young males and so we did a lot of focus groups asking them what they would find embarrassing or you know what's a, an immediate harm that they they consider and that was one of them so it seems to be working which is great. So then that just gives you a taste for the cartoon storylines that we see and hopefully that's um, that's engaged you as well and so as well as the storylines they also have access to teacher and student summaries online the teachers get emailed these and so does the students after each lesson and they can run through it as a class or do it for homework or stick it in their workbooks. And then as well as the, the, sorry, the summaries, we have the optional class activities which is delivered by the teacher. Now these come in a range of different formats depending on how long the teacher has to prepare for a lesson. So some are just as simple as photocopying or printing out a group worksheet and others require a little bit more time. So here's an example of one of the worksheets. This is for a group discussion and as you can see we always refer back to the storylines in these activities so that we can try and reinforce that information that the students learnt. So demonstrating the effectiveness or the efficacy efficacy and effectiveness of our programs is really important to us. To date we've run six cluster randomised control trials in Australia. We've completed four of these and we have two ongoing as well as a pilot trial in the UK. So in total we've had 157 schools and 14,000 students participate in our trials so far and we've um, published 14 papers on their effectiveness in some of the leading journals in our field. So without going into detail about all these trials, I just wanted to give you an idea of how we conduct this research to, 
to ensure that our programs are effective before we um, implement them in schools or roll them out into schools. So this is the Climate Schools Alcohol and Cannabis trial and the aim of this trial was to see if the Climate Schools model could be effective in preventing the use of alcohol and Australia's most commonly used illicit drug, cannabis, amongst adolescents. So what we did was ran a cluster RCT in 764 students from 10 schools with a mean age of 13 years. We randomised schools to either receive the intervention, which was the Climate Schools program, or to receive um, their usual drug education and these groups were in our control group. Sorry, these schools were in our control group. So as you can see on that table below, both groups completed the baseline survey, the intervention group then completed the Climate Schools Alcohol Module and the Alcohol and Cannabis Module six months later, and then all schools Oh, Nikki, Nikki, we've lost... the post... Oh, sorry, we just lost you on sound for a moment there, Nikki. Test six. <laughs> So when we look at alcohol and cannabis knowledge, you can see that, oh, yeah. We're just losing you on sound. Just check your oh, microphone. Am I back? Yes, you're back. I'll try and turn, I'll turn. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so this graph, the climate group, or those students who receive those interventions are in the blue line and the control groups are in the red and as you can see those who received the interventions had significantly increases as indicated by the stars immediately post the intervention and again at 6 and 12 months following on both alcohol and cannabis related knowledge. As well as looking at knowledge and attitudes, we're also interested in what effect we can have on their behaviour. And what we found was that for those students who received the intervention, they actually decreased the average amount of alcohol they were drinking in a single occasion and our control group increases significantly over that trial period. Although our use of cannabis was relatively low amongst our sample, what we did find was that those who were using in our control group, the frequency of that use increased over the trial and the frequency of our use in our climate group actually decreased. So as well as these outcomes on drug and, drugs and alcohol, um, we also look at a number of secondary outcomes including truancy and what we found was that those in the control group increased their number of truant days and those in the intervention decreases over the trial period. And finally, in terms of psychological distress, we found that our intervention group was significantly lower than our control group in levels of psychological distress at 6 and 12 months following those interventions. So after the program, we also get students and teachers to evaluate them. Here we had a random sample of 98 students evaluate this program and we found that 93% said that the cartoons were appropriate and enjoyable and 85% said that they would use this information in their own lives. In terms of teachers, we had 91% of teachers say that it met the outcomes of the syllabus well, 92% of students liked the program and three quarters of teachers endorsed the course as better than others and would recommend it in the future. So we were really happy with um, with these results and since this we've also continued to improve our programs from the feedback that we've received from teachers. So without going into any more detail about the other trials, in total from these um, uh, different trials that we've run, we've found that those who receive the climate interventions have significantly sorry, significant increases in knowledge of alcohol, cannabis and psychostimulants compared to controls, significant decreases in use of alcohol and other drugs, significant reduced, significantly reduced harms related to alcohol and ecstasy, decreased intentions to use drugs in the future and we've been well received by teachers, students and the school communities. So who has climate reached? Well as well as 157 schools that have participated in our trials, we've now made the programs available free of charge online and in the last year we've had 144 schools and 22 organisations register and are actively using our, um, our materials. So if you haven't registered and you would like to try them, um, please do so, please register and we'll approve your registration. 
So I'll just hand back now to Lexine who will um, talk to you about how, how do we help schools and parents access evidence-based resources such as climate schools. So thanks for listening. Okay, thanks very much, um, Nikki. That was great to hear. And I guess what's really important um, about your your talk and about climate schools is that you've got that hard evidence from all of that testing in schools that it, that it really is having benefits for students. And so teachers will know that they're not investing lots of time and energy into implementing something that's not going to actually do anything. You've actually got that hard data behind it, which is great. And I've heard you say in a previous talk that um, that students just love the cartoons so much that they can't get enough. So it's a bit like, I think you mentioned, a bit like watching an episode of Home and Away or something. They need to stay tuned to find out who gets together with who, etc. That's it. We have to do what we can to get the students in and keep them in. Keep them interested, yeah. Okay, well now, um, just to wrap up, I'm going to talk about some um, some resources um, to help with um, access, so access to resources for parents um, and for schools. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our po uh, Positive Choices Program project, which was funded by the Department of Health and is basically a project all about trying to improve access for schools across Australia to these um, drug prevention resources. So the first part of this was the development of um, an illegal drugs resource package. So over the last few years, our team has been developing a booklet series for teachers, parents and students. So as you can see, separate booklets there, which contain um, evidence-based um, information about drugs, about their effects and about the risks. Um, and also guidance, so specifically um, for students, the student booklet contains guidance on how to be assertive when you're, um, when you're in a situation where there might be pressure to try a substance and also how to help a friend who might have taken a substance. We also provide access to um, an online drug education game called Pure Rush and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment and how you could get access to that. And for teachers and parents, there's several pages of information and guidance about what they can do to help protect against drug use and also how to start those conversations, how to keep the communication lines open um, with young people. And finally, for teachers, there's a really useful overview of all of the, um, of the school-based prevention programs that they might be able to implement that have a strong evidence base so that are, are proven to, to have uh, improve student well-being. So there's an overview about how you might be able to access those. So this is just a sneak peek of the inside of the booklets and as you can see there's quite a lot in there but it's in a really um, sort of compact um, small booklet package and these booklets can be um, sorry can be downloaded um, or accessed electronically but in addition we have um, last year we've also distributed um, copies of the booklets to 3,000 schools secondary schools across Australia so we were keeping Australia post pretty busy that week um, and we'd be really happy if you haven't received, if your school hasn't received a copy of um, the booklet or copies of the booklet, we'd be really happy to make available a, a hard copy of the teacher booklet to any of the um, registrants of today's webinar so please just email your postal address and we'll send a teacher booklet out to you. Now I'll just tell you a little bit about the Pure Rush um, drug education game. Um, and the idea um, behind this was we wanted to look at what can we do to make um, drug education interesting and engaging for young people. Now, of course, the cartoons are one way um, that, that we can do that. The, the, as Nikki mentioned, the um, young people are really interested in the cartoons. But we wanted to see, well, are there other creative ways that we could um, explore to communicate drug education to young people? And the idea that... Um, we came up with was a drug education game. So the concept behind Pure Rush is that um, the avatar, the character, so the little girl there in the top or the little boy in the bottom, what you need to do in the game is run as fast as you can to get to a music festival. And if you don't get there in time, you might not get tickets because there's only two left. So you're running as fast as possible. But along the way, there are 
um, obstacles in the way and also some of those obstacles are drugs so you can see a cannabis leaf on the bottom and then some pills there and students receive as they're playing the game messages about the harmful effects of drugs and they also learn through um, interactive learning because Colliding with these substances in the game results in impaired performance effects. So they're no longer allowed, um, sorry, they're no longer able to run very fast or they're not able to jump very high. So their, their performance gets stuffed up basically. So they learn in order to um, succeed in the game that they need to avoid the drugs by jumping over them. So we get um, some really great feedback from students um, when they've played the game. So they find this a really fun game to play. They've also told us that they find the information useful. So it's a great way to start this conversation with young people. And so if you're interested, we'd encourage you to have a play yourself. Nikki and I um, find it quite fun to play as well. So it's not just for young people. Um, it's free for anyone to use. You can play it online or it's also available as an app on um, Google Play or iTunes. If you're not brave enough to play yourself, we can watch our demo video. And we also have companion booklets that go along with the game so that you can get students to play the game and then read some the booklets which link back to the, um, the messages within the game. So to really reinforce any learning that might occur. Okay, so the second part of Positive Choices was the development of an online portal. And this was really in recognition of the fact that the internet presents a great opportunity for the dissemination um, of drug prevention because we can constantly be updating the information as new evidence, um, as new research and new science developments come to light. And so to start this project, we conducted a scoping um, exercise with teachers and parents who told us that that they and their um, the young people that they worked with were already using the internet to access information. But the problem was that um, often the information was of dubious quality. It was unclear what the quality was going to be. And so what they told us was that there's really um, a need for a central access point for drug information and prevention um, resources and a place where there would be credible and accurate evidence-based resources. And so the Positive Choices Online Portal was developed to be the go-to place nationally for teachers, parents and students to access drug information and resources. And there was a focus on resources and programs that are engaging and interactive and of course have that solid science behind them. And we developed it in consultation with teachers, parents and students who told us what they wanted um, and it was developed to help them find what they were needing in the classroom or home situation. Now I'm just going to show you now a preview um, of the portal. So basically what you can see here is that there are separate windows for teachers, parents and students. And so for example, a parent could go into this to this window here and find, um, they could search by a particular drug that they might want to find out information about. They could access um, guidelines, information, guidance for how they might talk to their teenager, how to have those, how to start those difficult conversations with teenagers and general support sort of resources. And likewise for teachers, going through the teacher window, you might want to um, search for resources that meet with a particular year level um, or a particular resource type. You might want to find a game or a video or um, a fact sheet or a full program to implement within your classroom. So the portal really facilitates searching for exactly what you need and is a central point for over 100 um, different types of resources. Okay, so we're very happy to announce um, that the Positive Choices online portal will be launched very, very soon. Um, so what we would encourage you to do is to subscribe at www.positivechoices.org.au and then you'll be notified as soon as it is launched. Okay, so we started this presentation by saying um, what can parents and teachers do? So just to summarise the kind of take home message in terms of parents, we're providing teenagers with accurate factual information about drugs and alcohol and their potential harms is really important. Um, and 
Furthermore, avoiding supplying alcohol to teenagers is something that the research is really telling us is important. Being involved, establishing and maintaining good communication, and also communicating to teenagers clear rules and expectations about drug use. And in terms of resources, we would point you to the parent booklet, which has um, guidance on these points, and also the online portal, which once launched will provide access to a range of fact sheets, videos, and programs to help support parents. And finally, teachers, what can they do? Well, again, providing accurate information is really important, keeping those communication um, channels around drugs and alcohol open and providing that normative information about um, drug use. So letting teenagers know that actually not everyone is, uh, not everyone is using these substances. It's actually quite rare. And um, finally, implementing one of the evidence-based um, prevention programs within the classroom. So Climate Schools is one example, but there's other um, evidence-based programs that you could access via Positive Choices to implement within the classroom. Um, and so for more information, um, having downloading our teacher booklet, um, visiting the Climate Schools website, and also visiting the Positive Choices online portal. Okay, so thank you very much um, for listening and we do have some um, questions coming through. So we'll um, have some time now just to answer questions from the audience. Um, so the first question that I've got through um, is a question about resources for um, different cultural groups. Um, Nikki, so anything for um, Indigenous people or migrants? Um, any comment on that, Nikki? Hi, thanks for that question. Um, we don't have any climate schools resources currently available for different groups. We are hoping to get some funding to develop um, an Indigenous program. But what we do have is a link on the Positive Choices website. Sorry, not a link, it's, it's a filter that you can filter by um, Indigenous programs. And so when that's launched, you'll be able to see that there are a, a range of programs out there or fact sheets that that are relevant and you can use. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, and it's certainly something that we're very interesting to de interested to develop in our group, isn't it? Um, sort of specific resources that are um, culturally appropriate for um, other different groups. That's sort of the next step, isn't it? That's it. Yeah. Okay, we've got an interesting comment um, coming here that says, um, so someone that lives in um, Hong Kong, I believe, and says that the culture here is very different in that parents are more than okay to have teenagers drink with meals and often come back to the boarding house having had alcohol. So training, this is a teacher, I, I imagine, who's, who's finding that training parents is something that he's finding himself needing to do. Do you have a comment on that at all, Nikki? Yeah, sure. So I think, I'm not sure about the culture in Hong Kong, but the culture in Australia, I think there's a quite a big misconception that providing students or young people with alcohol will then reduce the risk or harm associated or reduce the uptake of you know, harmful drinking later on. But what we're actually finding is that the research is saying that even giving them that little bit, even supplying them with that little bit of alcohol at a party or at home, really is having the opposite effect and it is a risk factor for then later use or sorry earlier onset of drinking. So the, the best message we can give to that is to try and delay that as long as possible and to have mm. good modelling at home. Mm. Yeah, so, so being, I guess that was one of the points earlier on the slide, being clear um, with teenagers about what parents' expectations are for them and also with other parents that it's that, you know, if you believe it's not okay for your child to be drinking at parties, then making sure other parents know that that's how you feel as well. That's it. Setting clear goals between, yeah, with your own family, but also if you can do that with friends, that has an added benefit as well. Okay, great. We've got an easy question that I can handle, which is, um, can we get a copy of the slides? And the answer to that is absolutely. We'll be sending um, them out to you all. Um, so another one here is, um, how do teachers find implementing climate, um, the climate program, along with everything else that they have to do? I guess that might be a common worry for, for teachers. Sure. Yeah, it is, a, it is a worry and I definitely understand the time pressures that teachers have in schools when they have to, you know, deliver 
um, good maths education, science education, and then try and shove in a bit of drug education in there. But what we've done is to make this um, the implementation of climate as easy as possible. So we have it to fit within the school curriculum. It addresses different syllabus outcomes for each of the state as well as the new Australian national curriculum. Um, so really what we're doing is providing a resource that take that takes the work away and instead of them having to implement something else that they may have been doing previously or they may have to do some research themselves, this really is just a really quick and easy program to put into classes that takes no additional training and really does the work for them. Okay, great Nikki and I've got, we've got quite a few questions to get through so I'll move you along. Um, can you commence the climate schools program at year 10 level or is it necessary for them to have done the younger um, year 8 and year 9 program first? Okay, yep, sure. So you can definitely do that. At the moment, the psychostimulant and cannabis module can be implemented for year 10 students. There's definitely no prerequisite to do the other modules prior. That's just so we have the option of giving schools an entire kind of suite of programs if they wish to do that with their classes. And if they do happen to deliver them all sequentially, that's fabulous. If not, they can definitely deliver them um, individually. As well as those three that I spoke about, we're also finishing up a trial with um, a PhD student here, Katrina Champion, who's developed a program on ecstasy and new emerging psychoactive substances. So that is also developed for Year 10 kids. Our preliminary results are showing that's really effective as well in increasing the knowledge and we're seeing some um, changes in intentions and behaviour. But I think it will be next year that we're going to launch that one on our website, so stay tuned. Okay, great. Now I've got another question that's interesting and I think relevant to a lot of people. Do the resources um, directly link to the Australian curriculum or uh, the, the curriculum in South Australia? Okay, so we currently on the website we've currently got links to each of the different state curriculums so you can go and have a look. And we have also got the drafts up there for the national curriculum. Um, we're still waiting, I think, along with everyone else for the final approval of if when that's being rolled out, but we're, we're there and we're ready. So if you can't find what you're looking for, please feel free to email us and we'll do the, um, we'll address the curriculum for you so you know exactly what parts you're ticking off. Okay, excellent. Um, I've got another question. Do you um, provide any information to students about sort of the legal aspects of um, drug use or legal problems or what they might um, do, how they might get help, I guess, when they run into legal problems? Um, yeah, we do. In the... In the climate program, we, we talk about the different laws around the use of drug and alcohol by young people. We, I'm just looking at our booklet, sorry, um, yes. in our Positive Choices booklets, <laughs> we have a section in there about illegal drugs and the law and in there, sorry, I'm not sure if this is a good way to do it, but um, in I'm there what we can see. <laughs> You probably can't see that well, but that kind of talks about the different processes, sorry, over there. It talks about the different processes of, or, or the different outcomes for minor drug offences and major drug offences and broken down by state as well. We've got some more information about that. So um, yeah, these booklets have, have some great information about that. Okay, excellent. So that's for the students so that they can be informed about um, what are possible consequences for them. Yeah, that's it. And that's also um, in the parent and teacher booklets as well so that they understand as well. And we also talk about drug use in schools in there. Okay, I've got a question here. Um, would the Year 10 resources cater for students with very low um, literacy levels? I think all the climate schools resources, because they're developed with such in-depth consultation with the students and a, a really wide array of students, we we do find that most students are able to understand the concepts and the cartoons are quite low literacy levels so they'll be able to hopefully pick up the messages. Um, the different activities you can definitely you know choose ones that work for you that you could do role plays if you don't think the students could handle doing the you know the more detailed worksheets so hopefully we, we've got things to cater for for most groups. 
Okay, fabulous. All right, I won't make you um, answer too many more, Nikki, but just another one here that I think is quite an interesting one. She says, any tips for integrating these resources without specific class time being allocated? I know that's probably a tricky one, but did you have any thoughts on that? I think the Positive Choices portal is really good for this. So the Climate Schools programs, they are developed to be a program, a six lesson you know, program to go in in class time. Um, in saying that, they, they can go into any classes, it can be roll call classes, um, you know, prep, they don't have to be during the health classes. We've also started giving them to uh, links to students to do outside class, but the Positive Choices portal is not only going to have links to programs, but it's also going to have quick links to like quick fact sheets or quick activities you can do with your classes. So they don't really have to be an entire lesson or entire program incorporated into your um, into your school timetable. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. Now, we would like to just say, uh, just to clarify, we will be sending out an email um, to you all, which will include the handouts, but also um, a link to the video of the session. So, um, you're welcome to pass that on to your colleagues or anything, anyone else that you think might be um, interested. And we'd love it if you would um, take five minutes to fill in our um, feedback survey uh, for the webinar. If we didn't get, we did have a lot of questions, um, so we may not have got to all of them. So, if you um, have have a question that we didn't answer, um, please feel free to email it through to us. Um, and also, as you can see on this slide, we do have um, three more talks coming up over the year. So we hope that you've enjoyed this one. We're really um, grateful that you took part in our um, webinar series. And so do um, keep an ear out for the ones um, coming up over the year and you can join our mailing list, which will allow you to receive updates about all of those. And there's the web link where you'll be able to access the video recording. So thank you very much, Nikki, for joining us um, today. And thank you to all the okay. participants for making it such a um, successful session and asking thought-provoking questions. And we'll see you at the next um, webinar. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks and bye.